Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our second Workplace Live of 2022. I'm Danny Evans from the Global B2B Reality Labs team here at Meta, joining you live from sunny Miami. Those of you who are used to joining our other social media lives will know that we were joined by an incredible array of thought leaders in culture, leadership, and the employee experience space. If you did tune in to Workplace Sessions last year, you will know that we are heavily focused on employee experience, or to put it more accurately, on how leaders can create an organization where employees want, not need, to show up to work. This year, our live series is focused on driving conversation around the future of work, gaining insight from wonderful guest speakers on how leaders should be navigating through, redesigning, and ultimately enabling their organizations to thrive in the rapidly changing world of work. The topic of future of work is not a new one, it's been an area of focus in consultancy firms, technology companies, and amongst thought leaders for a number of years. But thanks largely to the overnight force change that COVID-19 pandemic brought to the global workplace, it has become a mainstream topic, which every leader and organization is now focused on. My guest today is somebody who has been thinking about this topic for a number of years. Ben Eubanks is an author, speaker, and researcher. He is the owner and principal analyst at Lighthouse Research and Advisory, working with HR, talent, and learning and development leaders across the globe to solve business challenges. He also maintains Upstart HR, a blog that has touched the lives of more than 1 million business leaders since its inception. And if all of that wasn't enough, he's also the author of the wonderful Artificial Intelligence for HR book, which looks at how AI can support and develop a successful workforce. Now, before I hand it over to Ben, I just want to remind you all that I want to put as many questions to Ben as possible from the audience. So please type any questions that you have into the comments as you think of them, and one of the team will get them to me so I can try to get as many as we can get answered before we reach the half hour. So without further ado, welcome, Ben. Thank you so much for joining me today. And to kick off, where in the world are you joining from us today? Hey, Dan, so glad to be here with you and with everyone else here for this live session. It's going to be a ton of fun, great conversation. I'm based up in Huntsville, Alabama, so just a little bit north of you down in Miami, but probably having some of the same kind of weather, I would imagine. Fantastic. Um, well, Ben, I know we've got a lot to cover today, and I'm anticipating we're going to have a great engaged audience. So maybe to start off, uh, future work is a big topic. Um, it can mean different things to organizations, particularly in how they should be approaching it. Um, I'm interested to understand what the future of work means to you. One of the things that I'm always a fan of is when I can bring this back around to the human piece of, of what we do. And I think that the good thing about talking about the future of work is my perspective, my vision, and what the research tells me is that it's going to be very distinctly human. And so there's, there's lots of different ways I can point that out. For example, the number of job postings right now for HR and talent professionals is 600% higher than they expect it to be pre-pandemic because companies are saying, hey, wait a minute, we've realized that we've got to really invest in the people side of this. So we're going to keep them. And we're going to attract them, right? So that's that's showing us right there that companies are going to put more emphasis on that, especially on the people side. Um, but the other piece of it too is, as you, you mentioned the book there, which I appreciate, uh, one of the things in, that I wrote about in there is when we look at the history of automation, every time automation comes through, whether it's mechanical automation or digital automation, the work that's left behind is a little more human than the work that was there before, right? It strips away some of the robotic stuff, some of the things we don't even really like to do that much anyway, frankly, and it leaves behind the human skills of work that allow us to really focus on what matters most and build deeper relationships and do our most creative work. That's what I think the future of work looks like. Fantastic. And I love how you said that it's distinctly human. I think that's such a, an important part as we think about, right, how the world of work will evolve. I'm curious, maybe to play off that topic, what are, what are some of the current trends? Um, you talked a about a few that people should be thinking about or trying to tackle as we think about the, sort of this change and the importance of those human skills. Yes. I think employers are realizing with some of the, the retention issues that companies are facing, some of the attraction and hiring issues that they're facing, I think that this conversation around making work more human, it can feel very vague, like, yeah, that's a great platitude, but what do I do next? And it comes down to understanding what your people need from you, understanding what candidates need from you. So, um, for example, in the data, we see that people are leaving their jobs more often because of stress and burnout, especially frontline workers. So how do we provide them opportunities, flexibility, things that are going to help to connect more deeply with them, help them feel tethered to the organization and to their leadership? 
Right? A big part of this can't just be on our shoulders, by the way. We need to co-opt our managers, bring them along for the ride, because what the data tell us is that if a worker says, I do not feel supported by my direct leader, they're twice as likely to leave, not at some vague point far in the future, but within the next 30 days. So there's so much stuff happening here on the retention side and then on the, the hiring side. So I'm trying to hit some of these big points that most employers I'm talking to are concerned with right now. On the hiring side, we're seeing some really interesting stuff come up in the data where candidates are saying, I wanna hear about career opportunities beyond the job I'm applying for in the process. And they're using that future vision, the company's helping them cast for that job as a way to sift through and pick which offer they wanna accept. So it's not just about saying, I wanna offer you the most money now or the best job right now, but what's next down the line? And is that an opportunity for us? So there's a lot of opportunity to really see what people are looking for and focus on those needs if you want to attract them and keep them. Uh, it's, it's so fascinating. And I, again, I think a great point you called out too about thinking about the portions of the workforce are there on the front line, right? And the work that's there, how to bring them and make them feel connected, but also, right, continue to help them grow in their journeys, right? It's such an important part of um, how we think about, right, the, the workforce moving forward. For sure, yes. Um, Sorry, oh no, please go ahead. I was just gonna add one, one quick point. We looked at some, in some of the data recently, we looked at the reasons that candidates are ghosting employers. And so if anybody out there, right, <laughs> like I'll give you, you know, the virtual hug here, cause I know employers are really facing this and they're dealing with this every single day. One of the things we saw in there, especially for frontline workers is the number one reason they apply and then disappear is because in those conversations, the early discussions and some of the things they're seeing on your career site, they're not seeing you talk about what other opportunities are available. So for a frontline worker, that's the number one reason that they back away and, and ghost an employer during that process. So it's not just a, a, a thing that's interesting or an interesting data point, but this is costing you headaches, and friction and problems and challenges every day if you're not doing it well. Uh, I love that, love that call out. And I know we're gonna come back, you mentioned too, the importance of like line managers and people managers uh, and the role that they play here. So we'll come back to that in, in just a second. I'm curious, um, Maybe a second topic, obviously your book, right? AI for HR looks at what AI is and how it can support HR, right? From talent acquisition to L&D and learning development with some great case studies throughout to underpin that. Um, you know, when I was reading it towards the end of the book, you posed, uh, I thought a really um, provoking question, right? Does technology make work uh, more human or less human? Um, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on this. We started to touch on it, but uh, we'd love to hear more. You know, what's funny is as I was finishing the book, the publisher said, hey, we need you to put in a thousand more words to finish this. I'm like, nah, I think I've said everything I have to say, but they said, you've got to find a thousand more words. And so I had just been reading that morning, an article from The Guardian that said, job hunting in the age of AI is, I quote, grim and dehumanizing. And I know there's not a single leader listening right now that says, you know what, we really want our, our job uh, application process to look like grim and dehumanizing. And yet it ends up that way if we're using technology just for the sake of it, we've got to use it to create more emphasis on the human experiences, the human connections, the opportunities to, to really build deeper relationships with people. If the technology is there just to keep people at arm's length and to never get closer to them, then it's not serving its true purpose and the real value that it can offer. So I think that's the piece where, yes, it can make it absolutely less human. It can do that for sure. But if we're designing it and we're, in, and we're intentionally focusing on how do we use this to emphasize those points where we come in contact with people. There's so much research that says around experience design, that says that can be done and it can be done well, but it can't be done you know, accidentally. You don't accidentally win the Super Bowl. You don't accidentally, you know, you know, win at anything. You have to intentionally focus on that and invest in it. And again, I think it, it underscores right the importance of, and I'll use the word intentionality, right? Just so important. Mm -hmm. Thinking about putting people at the, at the center, right? And how you sort of design this. Um, and maybe kind of on this the theme about the, the role of technology, we've got a question um, from Steve that came in. Um, how will Oculus, and maybe we can expand it to, to virtual reality, be a part of the future of work? So there's a lot of really interesting things here that I've been watching and very curious about. The, the biggest focus so far that I've seen is virtual reality as a piece of how we, we operate at work has a very specific focus on HR and learning development and how we train people. So I've, I've talked to plenty of organizations recently that are using these as a, as an, as a tool to, to help them build that up. And it was funny because I was chatting with you before we even went live about a company I spoke with recently that said, hey, we've got people that are on the shop floor. They're kind of, you know, a little gruff, a little rough around the edges. And there's, they're saying, hey, I'm not doing that stuff. Give me the normal training. I want, a, I want a slideshow. I want a video. I want something else. And so they said, we took the one who was most opposed to it, the most vocal opponent and said, hey, try this. If you don't like it, 
or we'll find another option. And two minutes in, they put him through an experience that he pulls it off and says, okay, everybody, you've got to see what this looks like. And he becomes the most vocal up, uh, proponent for this because he had a chance to see that. So I think the, the training element is really important there. One of the other sides of it, though, I've, I've talked to a company recently that hires in New York City. And they said, when we, we have people that we want to come to the office, and that's, that's one of their things that they're looking for, their leadership believes in that. And so they said, We're, but we don't want them to get have uh, the wrong assumptions about what it's like, what it looks like here. So they actually have done a walkthrough of their office that you can then tour in VR online and you can watch and see what it looks like. All those experiences, what, oh, by the way, if you want coffee, here's where it is. And here's, you know, all those little things. And it lets them experience that before they even walk in. So they feel at home, the first step, the person they walk in instead of being in an unfamiliar territory. So there's some really fun ways to do this, to create different experiences. And part of it is, once this starts getting into the hands, especially of the most innovative companies that are out there, you'll see some new ideas that none of us have ever even thought of start to appear. And that's what really excites me. Yeah, I know. I love those use cases. I know we were chatting right, right before this. And I think, that especially the one you just mentioned, I love that in terms of sort of that immersive tour. Think about how many folks, right, who may have started new jobs during the course of the pandemic, right, onboarded remotely. Maybe some have not even been back to an office yet, right? Trying to create, right, find ways where you can bring them closer, right, to the company, to the culture. Um, I think it's such a wonderful use of, of VR um, and the possibilities there. Um, so thanks, Steve. That was a, a great question and a topic I think that Ben and I could probably talk a lot more about in another session as well. <laughs> um, so, so Ben, I, I, and again, I mentioned as I was reading through the book, one of the uh, chapters right, talks about sort of skills of the future, right? And I think in talking with leaders, I'm sure you're hearing it from leaders that you're working with, right? Uh, the really hot topic at the moment is around what skills are necessary to drive the future of work. Um, particularly as we think about, right, in some ways, uh, large portions of work may become more automated. Um, and so we're seeing right this pivot towards kind of, kinder or gentler environments, right, of which course line managers, people managers are really core part, right, of enabling this new environment and experience. Um, I'm curious, from your perspective, will soft skills become the currency of the future? Well, you, you've read the book, so you already know the answer to this, but I don't call them soft skills, I call them human skills, right? Because they, that's the real focus there. And the reason I call them that isn't just because I, I want to be different, but because I, when you look at what the, the research tells us, you look at the actual people who are developing some of the AI tools and things that are out there, people who are doing advanced robotics, they say, hey, those things over there, those human skills, like creativity and collaboration and curiosity, those things are really hard to program. They're really hard to develop into these tools. And so when I call them human skills, it's because it's something that we naturally have a talent for. It's a thing that we can do innately. There's actually a really fun concept that, uh, that I write about in the book called Morvik's Paradox, which I ran across. He was an AI researcher years ago. And he said, you know what's really intriguing? If we asked a six-year-old you know, to identify five or 10 objects in a room, they could easily do that. But if we try to ask a computer, it takes a lot of data, a lot of time to program it to be able to do that same thing. However, if we put a calculus equation in front of a six-year-old, they're going to, you know, walk away, you know, they don't have any idea, but the computer can do that really easily because it's very structured and very defined. I say that, I love that paradox, that example, because work is increasingly becoming broader, less defined, right? There's the more, the more vague tasks there are, the more, um, the less definition there is in a job, the more likely we're going to need a human to do it, frankly. And so there's, there's a lot of evidence behind that. McKinsey's research and some others have really backed that up. But that's what excites me, especially in the work that we do as HR and talent professionals, is there's, there's not a lot of definition around that. There are some things that are very defined and specific. If that's all you do, by the way, you should start developing some other skills now. But I don't see this coming through and wholesale knocking out the profession of HR and talent and the work that we do every day because there's too many human-focused things left to do. Yeah, and, and you bring up such a good point too, right, around like where there's less definition and structure, right? Inevitably, there's just going to be a need, right, for more of those uh, those human skills. And I agree, I, I, I tend to, I will use human skills as well as opposed to soft skills, and they're so critical. Um, I'm curious, we've got a, another question that came in, tons of good stuff coming in. So for the folks who are watching, please continue to send them in. Um, kind of to play off this topic, right, about people managers and line managers, um, what are some of the ways, right, that you would advise or recommend leaders think about really being able to train and upskill those managers in the workforce, knowing how critical of a role they're going to play? 
take this in so many directions. Um, I'll tell you, I talked recently with the head of leadership development at the Mayo Clinic, and we were talking about the way they assess and look for leaders. And she told me that the way that they ask questions, they have people that come back to them and say, no one's ever asked me about these things before. And I can tell what's <laughs> important to you as an organization. If I'm going to step into this role, if I'm, if I'm selected, and now I want to be selected even more, if I'm selected for this, though, I know from day one what you think is most important for me to do. And it's not just these tasks over here. And it's not just this operational stuff over there. It's truly being a leader of people. And so the, the data we have say that high-performing organizations have leaders that focus on recognition, leaders that focus on developing people up into other roles. I had, a, had someone recently, I was presenting to a group and a lady said it the best way, she said, my boss, when she steps a rung up on the ladder, she reaches back and pulls someone else up behind her. And I thought that was a great visual for what a great leader can do. So those are the kinds of things we need managers to do. And I'll go ahead and call all of us out because I've been there, I've done this the wrong way myself. We've got to stop picking leaders based on how long they've stuck around or on, they've capped out here in this, this role. So let's just move them over to a manager role because that's always, always, always a bad idea. Yeah, I love the, just thinking about that visual, right? Of sort of like climbing up the ladder and then reaching back to bring folks along with you. Like, so fantastic, right? Thinking about, right, leaders really serving the people that they are um, overseeing, right? Rather than more of that direct sort of like managerial style. It's fantastic. Well, that's what creates the best relationships. Again, we're bringing back to the human concept at the beginning. Yeah. People never say, you know what, the best leader I ever had was so task driven and very productive and they got a lot of things done. You now they say the best leaders made me feel good about myself. The best leaders made me believe I could do things that I didn't think I could do myself. And they showed me that I was capable of more. And so that's one of the things I always challenge people to do is if any of you have ever worked with a great leader, hey, you want to give them a kudos, pop their name in the chat right now. Just give them a, like a thumbs up virtually to let them know because I... I always, once a year, reach back out to my boss who I had who made the most impact on my career just to remind her how much I appreciate where I am today because of what she did for me eight, nine, ten years ago now. And so I think that's so critical. And one of the things we we don't celebrate and elevate those stories enough, the, the stories of a, of a bad boss, those get passed around pretty easily because they're, they're entertainment value. But we should be passing around the stories of amazing leaders to remind us all what that looks like. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, similarly, I, I think back to some of the uh, really amazing managers that I've had along the way and who I've stayed in touch with, because to your point, right, you can look back and you see where there's that moment where this really changed, right, my journey or my experience. And, and you think of them, right, sort of every time and you kind of come back, right. And, and I think also too, those leaders love them to see and hear the stories of, you know, where has Ben now, right, eight, nine, 10 years later, right, because again, for them, right, it's all about people at the end of the day, which is just, it's so, so important. One, can I throw one more comment at you really quickly? Please, yes. One of my good friends retired last year from Kimberly Clark. He worked in organizational development for many, many years. He was an engineer that got into like an HR adjacent role and he loved it, right? He was, his mindset was perfect fit for that. But I asked him, I said, looking back, what was your legacy? What mattered the most? You know, you worked on all these incredible projects, all this organizational redesign, you helped move through some of these really big changes. He said, yeah, I did all those projects and stuff, but the thing that matters most to my legacy is the relationships that I built. So just an encouragement to everyone else out there that if you need just one more, one more reminder, that's someone who's gone through his entire career, has had an incredibly successful run and looking back doesn't say, oh yeah, I'm glad I hit, you know, killed it on that project or scored this thing. It's, I made relationships and they, they're going to last. That's fan It's fantastic. Um, I love it. Uh, well, I, I feel like we could probably go on this topic too, even more. Um, but we've got another question that's come in, Ben, and this one's from Kara um, on LinkedIn. How would you suggest facilitating, you know, traditionally in-person employee events um, that are still inclusive of, still inclusive and can engage remote employees? That's a challenge. I'll go ahead and admit that, right? And in the data tell us that when you have people who are at a central location, you have others who are outside around that, that there's a natural fallout to that. There's a natural challenge to getting everybody else to feel like they're part of that. I've worked for an organization in the past, by the way, where I was not part of the, the main headquarters location. And occasionally you get on the distribution list for, hey, there's this party going on or this other thing going on. You're like, ah, what's going on for me? So I fully and completely understand the, the frustration that can cause. When it comes to how to do that well, you've got to think about it just differently. Frankly, you've got to think about different ways to do it. Um, I'm not a big fan of the uh, virtual happy hour stuff. I have four kids, right? I'm not a big fan of that. 
I have a good friend here locally that works for a company. They have, they have some in office and some remote staff. One of the things that company does is it finds out how many, how many kids someone has, if they're married or not, or if they you know, have a significant other. They send them movie tickets in the mail. They send them other things like, hey, the, the local baseball team, they'll send them tickets in the mail to come and see that team. They do things like that, not saying, oh, you've got to get here with everybody else, but they find out what's important or interesting to them, and they try to give them ways to celebrate that with the people that they care most about. And sometimes, you know, sometimes that may have nothing at all to do with work, but they're like, hey, we're here because someone cared about us that way. I'll give you one more thing. There's a great book somewhere back there on that shelf called Giftology. And I, I love the book because I'm terrible at giving gifts. All right, I'll admit that one right here, fully live for everybody to see. In the book, he talks about, we should be giving gifts that the other person wants to receive, not the gift we want them to have. Okay, mm -hmm. and again, that's the problem that I've, I've run across. And so when we are thinking about how do we make someone feel connected, engaged, we need to think about how do we give them something that they wanna receive right? Not the thing we want them to have, not just another thing with our logo on it, not just another thing that makes us look good or is a branding opportunity for us, not just the shirt, right? All those things. But what is something that's going to make them smile and be excited about that and can't wait to tell someone else that their company cares about them so much that they did this thing for them, whether large or small, because they know what matters. And a, a big part of this, frankly, comes back to that manager relationship. We can't know all the stuff, right? We can't know everything about everyone. But if Dan's leader knows that Dan is secretly, you know, on this mission in life to visit every baseball stadium, maybe he buys him tickets to two places he hasn't been to yet, right? And so it just comes down to really being intentional about that. It can't be, as I said earlier, an accidental, we're going to accidentally find this thing, or it's going to be this one button that hits everybody. It's too, too difficult for that. Great question, Kara. And I wish I had like the simple answer for you, but there's some good things to go on. And again, I think it just underscores, right, the importance of like being intentional. Um, I took a note, I'm going to be adding Giftology to my Amazon cart after this session, picked it up. I will admit that I'm a work in progress on gift giving as well. Um, but I love that. I, and again, right, it really comes down to knowing, right, knowing your people, what matters most to them. Um, and I love that you called out in some cases, right, it may be then perhaps giving them something that doesn't necessarily have anything to do, right, with, you know, your organization or, or your company, right, or your swag, but it will make a difference to them, right, and how they think about and how they feel, right, as part of your organization. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so great question, Kerry. We've got another question coming in. Love seeing all this engagement. So please continue to send them in. Um, this one is from uh, Varun on Facebook. What's one telltale sign that you are growing as a person and or as an employee? That's a great question. Goodness. So what's a sign that you're growing as a person or as an employee? One of the ways that I put it in the past is I would hate for anyone to stay in a job for 10 years and have that one year repeat 10 times. I'd much rather you have a 10 year span where you are, you're moving, you're changing, you're evolving, you're taking new roles, you're learning new skills, all those kinds of things. And so that's the, that's probably what I would encourage you there on um, Varun, right? To get the name right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I want to make sure and address it perfectly. So, Hey, that's what I would encourage you to do. If you're looking at yourself, that's what I would look for. But I would also encourage you to, if you're working with others, that's the thing you're looking for in them. We had an employee years ago, and she was 72 years old. She had been with us for years. I don't even know how many years, just for, it seemed like forever. Like she'd been born there and she was just gonna, you know, keep on going forever. And her boss, she came to her boss and said, hey, I wanted to, you know, I want to grow. And her boss said, well, you're the, you're the executive admin. There's no other, we built this position for you because there was nowhere else for you to go. And she said, what do you want to do? And the woman's like, well, I'm not really sure, but I really like, I really like, you know, just helping other people and making them feel at home. So she became, you know, in addition to her other job duties, when we had someone new start, she became the unofficial welcome wagon, right? She got to walk them around, show them everything. And she got to bake them some muffins the first day of their work and all these kind of things. And <laughs> just those little things, she was so excited and it cost us nothing. It didn't take anything from us. And from her, that was progress. Even at age 72, that was progress for her. And everyone loved getting to come in and meet Mary because she was the, the sweetest person that we had. So it doesn't matter if you're 27, 77, there are ways to continue growing. And as long as you keep that growth mindset, that that open mind that there are things that I can get better at, that's, that's what really matters the most. I, I absolutely love that. And I'm thinking about like, if I was a new employee and had that experience with her, she was probably also an incredible ambassador and advocate of the company. Like the energy that must've been coming through, you can't help but feel excited, right? From day one, which is amazing. Um, 
for everyone involved, right? For, for her, for the organization, for new employees coming in, just what a rich and uh, amazing experience. I, I would imagine the muffins were probably delicious as well. Banana nut were my favorite. I'll just go ahead and say that. <laughs> um, well, uh, amazing questions coming in. I know we're, we are almost at our time here. Um, ben, I'm going to throw one more bonus question at you, maybe rapid fire in 30 seconds. What do you think um, the future of work will look like in the metaverse? 30 seconds, that's not fair. Okay, so <laughs> I think this is gonna give us a chance to connect with people more deeply. It's gonna give us a chance to get around some of the things right now that are limiting our options to do that. Some of the questions we saw today were around, we're physically limited by space, by geographic distance, and this is gonna help us to overcome some of those things and really allow us to get deeper relationships, more meaning out of our work. That excites me so much because not a single one of us gets up in the morning and says, you know what, I really hope work isn't very meaningful today. We all want that in our jobs, and yet we're not sure or structurally things are in the, in the way of that. I would love to believe Metaverse is going to help us to overcome some of those things and allow us to truly feel more meaning in the work that we get to do every single day. And I'd want to, and that means everyone, right? Not just one group of people or another, but every single person has that same opportunity. That, that is incredible as a vision for that, and I really hope it comes true. Amazing. I do as well. And I know we could talk more about that. Hopefully, Ben, we will get the chance. Um, I want to say a big thank you to you for being such a fantastic guest. Um, loved our conversation today. I really, really enjoyed, uh, again, how you said the future work is going to be so distinctly human and the importance of being intentional as we think about designing these experiences. Um, and I also want to say a big thank you to everyone joining us today for this live, for being such an engaging audience, fantastic questions. Um, if you enjoyed today's conversation, and if you don't already, I would highly encourage you to subscribe to Ben's Upstart HR blog and tune in into his We're Only Human podcast. And we'll be back in July with another fantastic guest to talk about the future of work. We'll be talking to Jennifer McClure. Jennifer is recognized as a global influencer and expert on the future of work, strategic leadership, and innovative people strategies. She's an entrepreneur, keynote speaker, and high performance coach who works with leaders to leverage their influence, increase their impact, and accelerate results. The live will be on Thursday, July 14th. So mark your calendars, you won't wanna miss it. Um, and the team right now is dropping in the link to the next event into the comments. So you can go ahead and register your interest there. Again, a big thank you to Ben, to the team, um, and to everyone for joining us today um, and for all your questions. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much and take care.